Um, so good morning, everybody, um, uh, uh, and welcome back. Um, uh, for those of you that are just joining us uh, online or, uh, or here in person, uh, my name is uh, Tony Allen, and I'm the Chief Executive of the HTX Certification Scheme. A lot of people in the room here were, were here an hour or so ago when I gave a welcome to Manchester uh, speech, but this is me giving an instruction to what this standard is uh, all about. Uh, just before I do that, um, for those people that are here in person, you've all been given badges. These badges have got QR codes on. Um, you don't have to scan in and out of each of the sessions as you go to the sessions. But if you do, we can produce a continuous professional development certificate for you at the end of the week. So if you, do, if you have to fill out CPD or you have to demonstrate, conform, uh, um, demonstrate um, competence for professional bodies or for your part of your uh, appraisal or performance reviews or whatever it is, if you do scan your, your, your badge when you go in, each of the people will have a scanner. It keeps, keeps a record of the week and then you'll get a certificate at the end of the week that you can use for your evidence of attending things. Um, but you don't have to, so it's not uh, essential. Uh, if you're online, it does that automatically when you move from one room uh, to another um, in the online uh, stuff. So that's the announcements out of the way. Let me talk about uh, ISO IEC 27566. Um, uh, it'll become quite familiar as the week goes on. Uh, hopefully by the end of the week, you'll know exactly what it's all about and what we have been working on. Um, led by BSI. So BSI uh, were invited, shall we say, by the UK's at the time, it was the Department for Culture, Media and Sports, but it's now the Department for Science, Innovation and Technology uh, to look at the development of standards. And, and what the UK government realised was that the online safety legislation that it was passing, uh, which basically makes it a requirement to keep people safe online, um, didn't have the level of detail that was going to be needed to make that a practical reality. And so there are a series of things that need to happen uh, in order for the regulators to be able to enforce that, one of which is how you make the internet age aware and how you ensure the age of the users that are in different parts of the uh, online services. And this is particularly important when you look at pornographic content and the controls around what are now called part five controls in the Online Safety Act here in the UK. Uh, the UK has learned from its errors, uh, it's fair to say. The UK did pass a piece of legislation in 2017 called the Digital Economy Act. Part three of that act uh, brought in controls in relation to um, uh, uh, children's access to pornography and the, the legislation quite frankly collapsed in a mess uh, when they tried to bring it in and the reason why it collapsed is they hadn't thought through the consequences of how they were going to implement it they hadn't thought through the standards they hadn't thought through the requirements and they tried to bring it in and uh, it just didn't work it wasn't going to work so they abandoned it and they've now doing the online safety act uh, come back to it but standards form and age assurance standards form a critical part of that. So they asked BSI and I'm the uh, 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 technical editor of it uh, to develop standards on a global um, scale. Um, we're at different stages with different parts of standards. I'm going to talk through those. We currently have done uh, the second working international working draft and comments um, on that. Um, uh, hopefully this week that standard will progress to what's called the CD stage, which is the committee draft stage. So they, 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 it will be signed off by the committee that's meeting on the other side of the building, um, and it will then go out for a global ballot um, of all the member uh, states of the International Standards Organization uh, who get to uh, vote and pass comment um, on it at a global level. So it's been out effectively in draft um, a couple of times around the world, um, and it will go out as a, hopefully it will go out as a CD at the end of this week. So there's constant range of comments coming in and there's loads of opportunity for you to comment as well uh, throughout today and throughout the uh, sessions opportunities to comment we've got a team here that are gathering those comments uh, we're going to synthesize them together and they'll form they will form part of bsi's um, analysis of this document so we've got kind of two roles in this uh, both as the technical editor uh, on behalf of ISO, I've got an independent kind of uh, role of uh, I've got to take into account all the comments from all over the world, but also for BSI, BSI is the UK's national standards body, gets to submit its own comments, even though it's also leading the development of the document, to the uh, to the document through the, uh, the the process there. And that the BSI has a committee that is um, that is leading that piece of work with IST 3355. If you are a UK residents or UK business, then you could apply to be part of that uh, committee. You simply uh, either contact me or you go on BSI and go on the standards makers 
and you put in that you're interested in ISO 27566 and they will get through to the right committee and you can join that committee. Um, if you're overseas from a, um, uh, anywhere else in the world, you can do exactly the same thing in your home uh, national standards body. So if you need any help uh, finding out who that is, if you go on uh, iso.org forward slash members, you will get connected to that and you do exactly the same thing for your home state. You contact them and say, I'd like to be involved in ISO 27566 and they will put you in touch with which, however they're doing it. it the different um, countries do it in different ways, but however they're doing it in your country. Um, really encourage you to get involved in standards making. Uh, it is uh, something that um, I think uh, if you're ever involved in public policy work, um, you often feel as though when you deal with public policy work and you're dealing with legislatures and you're dealing with um, uh, government uh, agencies and civil servants and that you, you aren't really having much impact on what they're doing. Uh, you're talking and you're, you're providing your feedback, but you're not really having much impact. I would say with standards, it's totally different. Uh, you, you really can have an impact and really can make, make changes. And you can see the specific words that you've put forward as being the suggestion being adopted if everybody else agrees and we get to a point where there's a consensus agreement. So with standards, you get much more engaged and involved in, in, in stuff um, than you maybe do with legislation. So we had the, the 42nd meeting of, that's not the 42nd meeting to do with ISO 27566, it's to do with all the privacy stuff, was in Seoul, in Korea. Um, and we had some sessions there uh, where we went through the, uh, the issues um, and the, went through all the comments and reviewed all those comments and put out another uh, review. And then we have, we've had 168 comments globally uh, back uh, for consideration this week. So I have five sessions this week uh, where the, the, the committee will be considering those. Um, those comments relate to about uh, 10 or 11, what I've described as sticky issues. And you can see those all around the building. So we've set out what they are. We set out what the issue is. Uh, I would just urge, feel free to comment. Um, uh, you can go tech if you want and email the comments, or if you like old school, get a pen, sticky note, stick it on there, and the team will gather those comments together and feed them into the, the process. Um, so there's a few things uh, around. Um, some things around the title, some people don't like the words age assurance. Um, uh, some people don't like the, uh, the scope, they want it to be wider. Uh, some people want it to be narrow, so we're discussing things like that. About the use of the term biometrics. Uh, is it biometrics that we're talking about? Is it anthropometrics, which is measurement of the face and stuff like that? Uh, so this discussion about that. Age inference, where you uh, basically, the, the process there is that if somebody is something or uh, has access to something, they're likely to be over a certain age. So things like, for instance, if they're an airline pilot, a commercial airline pilot, they've legally got to be over 21 to be a commercial airline pilot and hold a license to be a commercial airline pilot. So that is age inference. The fact that they're a pilot, you can infer that they're likely to be over 21. So there's things like that. We're discussing, uh, discussing that. Uh, credentials. So we have a primary credentials, such as your passport, for instance. Uh, but then we have derived and secondary and auxiliary credentials and looking at which ones might be applicable and how they might work. So uh, things like um, your bank account record, which is a derived credential, um, or your um, uh, if you've got, for instance, a, a, a wallet, is a wallet a, a, a digital wallet? So things like the EU DI, uh, the European Union's digital identity wallet, is that a primary or a secondary credential? Discussions like that. How you actually say that that's that person, which is called attribute to individual binary. So you've got a, an attribute, which I'm over 18. You've got a person, me. How do you bind them together? So say that relates to that person. So that, the process that goes with that. What the definitions of age assurance are. Um, so uh, let's see lots of different definitions. So we're trying to bring that into a, a standardized set. Um, there's a lot of work going on in relation to privacy and privacy controls and these terms, unlinkability, untraceability, untrackability, they're quite complicated. So do get into those sessions and, and look at those. But what you're looking at there is you don't want, for instance, somebody who is being age assured for gambling because they like gambling, that being trackable to other things that they might do. So as an example of that, if you are using, for instance, you're using your bank account as a record of um, your um, activity uh, to prove that you're over 18 using Open Banking Connect. You don't want the bank account knowing that that's for a gambling company, because in the future, when you come to get a mortgage, they may go, well, hang on a second, this person has been gambling quite a lot. And that process of unlinkability, untraceability, untrackability is about protecting your digital footprint to be free to go and do the things you want to do that might require age restrictions, but that not affect 
your other um, uh, lifestyle choices. Um, uh, I'll leave the statisticians to work out what progressive and cumulative assurance is, but I'll describe it as basically, if you do two lots of age assurance, can you add them together to create more assurance or is it progressive? So you do one and that, that doesn't give you the result, then you do another. That's what that is all about. Uh, the indicators of confidence, Ian's already covered all the indicators of confidence. I'm going to cover them a little bit more in a moment. Uh, benchmarking, if you're going to measure something, you've got to measure something, uh, you've got something to measure it against. So what are we going to use for that? Uh, whether we're going to include documents in uh, document authentication, i.e. is it a passport? Not what's on the passport, is it actually a passport? I said one of the um, common things that I heard from uh, an ID verification company is that one of the re common reasons why people fail ID checks online is when it says, show me a, your passport, they hold their passport up, the front cover of it, so there's no data on it. So uh, you've got to think about, whether, is, it a, is it a real genuine document? And then all the measurement and testing stuff as, as well. So we're up to uh, this stage with them now. I'm going to go through the, uh, the, the updates we've got coming along. So Ian's mentioned the uh, indicators of confidence. There are five. Ian's only mentioned four because there's four that are measurable. There's one that is not measurable, um, but is still included within the, uh, the standard. So just taking you through these, zero is just I'm over 18. And that's giving me a, a zero indicator of confidence that I'm over 18. I could have made that up. But it's, I'm still, a lot of processes, a lot of online systems, a lot of things do rely on someone literally ticking a box to say I am over 18. As regulators are coming into the space, they're saying that's not good enough, but it may be good enough for some things. So for instance, if I want to uh, receive information about events that are suitable for people aged, obviously I'm between my age of 18 and 21, you can tell, but if I want to receive information about events for people aged 18 to 21, I can self-declare that I'm 18 to 21 and it will show me uh, events that are relevant to my, uh, as, as an audience. Yeah, that's self, that's self declaration, that's zero uh, level, but you don't need any confidence in that because you, you're just broadcasting information. Going through, you've got basic, which is where you've now got um, uh, a check, um, and it might be a, a pretty basic check, it might be a, involve a little bit of AI, it might be a, a, a bit of uh, checking whether there are any contraindicators, i.e., things that indicate that you might not be what you claim to be. Again, probably not enough for compliance with a legal obligation, but compliance with self selection for. Uh, games, uh, different types of games maybe could be uh, used in that. You've got standard, and I describe standard as largely what you see now uh, with age verification services, uh, where you go through some sort of process and you're checked, and you, it could be your uh, face image, it could be um, uh, hand geometry, it could be voice, it could be uh, document check, it could be open banking, it could be email verification. There's all sorts of different um, uh, methodologies out there. That's standard. Enhanced is where you might now say, well, actually, we've got a higher risk product here. We may be selling weapons or we may be uh, looking at things that we have to track or, or that sort of thing. And so you therefore you might want to do a higher level um, of assurance uh, for that. And then strict is where you pretty much really do need to know that that person is definitely over 18. So you might do multi factor checks or high accuracy checks. And an example there is people who are appearing in adult movies. Um, the actors and actresses that appear in those movies, you absolutely want to be sure that they are over 18. And just having a look at them and going, yeah, you look like you're over 18 isn't going to protect you if they uh, turn out to be juveniles um, in uh, pornographic movies. So those are just examples of how you might apply those. The standard doesn't apply those to any examples. The, the, the draft standard simply standardizes the five areas there and describes what they are and how you measure them. It's entirely at the hands of policymakers to decide which one goes with which use case. So the standard doesn't say you have to use this one or that one or whatever. Uh, it says this is if you do use enhanced, this is what enhanced means, and this is how you measure it, and this is how you assess whether or not a product complies um, with that. But the choice of when you use that is for regulators or for your policymakers or for your company's lawyers to determine what they want to do and then go out to the marketplace and buy products that meet those varying different levels. So the important thing with these is around uh, how you measure them and how you analyze them. This is what we're going to be talking about a lot during the course of this week. And this is open for debate. So don't take these as being the final positions. Uh, so basically, we're looking at 
the, uh, working with the regulators here in the UK, we've also been looking at what we call classification accuracy. So how likely is it to be right? Whatever method you're using, how likely is it to get the answer right? Um, and that uh, gives you a, a, a classification accuracy score. And you can see there a proposal for those uh, classification accuracies. That is not enough on its own to give you a good overview of the uh, efficacy of how these systems work. It's good enough as a headline for you to be able to say, okay, yeah, I didn't get that. It's not, you know, nine times out of 10, a basic check is gonna produce a result that's correct. So it gives you a headline, but actually what you need underneath it is other information if you're then the person that's doing the technical implementation of that, because you need to know, for instance, it, you may well have it where it's nine times out of 10, but if, if one, one time out of 10, it's wildly wrong, that's a problem, yeah? Um, so that's to do with the standard deviation. You may need to know the error rates because you can have false um, positive and false negative. Um, if you get, uh, I always get these the wrong way around in, in, my, in my head, but if you have a false uh, uh, positive, so you said that somebody is over 18 when they're not, that's a problem because you might break some laws. If you have a false negative, which is that, it says somebody isn't over 18 when they are, then that's a problem because you've lost a customer because they, they, they were legitimately able to go on and, and use your service. So that's the difference between, and you need to know that if you're doing implementation because that's gonna affect your onboarding, it's gonna affect your flow, it's gonna affect your customer base. So getting to know those, but as a headline, these high, these high level figures uh, here. So, yes, of course. We may need a microphone for you because uh, the people online won't be able to hear. So just let us get the microphone to you. Bear with. Just to say who you are as well so the people online know who's speaking. Hi there, I'm Jutta Kroll from the Digital Opportunities Foundation in Germany. I have a twofold question. One is, I, I'm not sure why you put 90% for basic. That sounds to me a bit high. And the second would be that maybe you have different percentages for different age groups. So it might work with 99% for over 60 or 80 people, but it might only work with 50% for children like 12 or 13 years. So whether Absolutely. that's in there or not, thank you. Thank you. So yeah, and what I would just say, I'll come on to you know one of the proposals that is that we're looking at is actually whether it should be ninety or whether it should be lower, and whether this might be a more realistic level of uh, of checking on this. And that's one of the things to discuss this week. So absolutely uh, feed into that um, that debate. And I do think there are issues in relation to how far you are. Uh, what, so there's a, a process uh, called age buffering that is where you might look at um, a, a, a stricter level between sort of 18 and 25 if 18 is your age of interest and then less strict as you go beyond 25. Uh, that rather depends on the tech that's being used to do that. So for instance, if you're doing um, facial age estimation, that's quite relevant to facial age estimation. If you're doing voice, it's much less relevant to that. And if you're doing things like hand geometry, it's much, much less relevant to that because basically those types of tech can really only tell if you're a child or an adult, as opposed to uh, uh, 18 uh, or, or over. So there's, there's, it, it, re it really does depend, but you're absolutely right. And I think how people apply these and, and, that, and that gets in, into the applied benchmarking will feed into that. And there's sessions this afternoon all about that benchmarking and all about what measures you have. So do throw those into the mix. Um, say uh, pictures is a thousand words. So there's a number of diagrams that are knocking around. And one of the things this week is to look at these diagrams. Uh, feel free to get your coloring pens out, your crayons, uh, draw us some diagrams. Uh, but this is one of the ones that's being considered, whether this adds value and makes it easier to understand and support the, um, uh, the, 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 the text. Uh, I'm not gonna go through it all, but uh, it looks at the kind of process, the workflow of whether or not you are, uh, how the actual uh, tech works and what the inputs and outputs are to that tech. So it starts on the top left there with, you know, somebody reaches something somewhere that triggers a need for the uh, supplier to know their age, uh, what we call an age-related eligibility decision. I know the standards, some of the wording you know, sometimes gets quite long, but that's uh, you know, basically you come, you, you turn up somewhere, either in person or online, and the, the, the provider has, a, has to make an age-related decision about you. 
And what they're going to do is they're going to put you through some process. They're either going to check your documents, they're going to uh, get a token about you. We've, we heard about the EU consent tokens earlier. Uh, or they're going to uh, check through a third party, through an age verification provider. That's going to go through some sort of um, uh, processing subsystem, which is then going to inform the RP. The RP is the relying party um, of what, what it thinks that person is. Uh, that, well, then the relying party then has their policy. So the policy may well be, well, we're only going to allow over 13 year olds to use our social media accounts. So the, the, the results from the age assurance are this person is, we think, 14. We are sure to a 99% confidence. Uh, your pol uh, the policy is, OK, that's acceptable to us to allow them to use an, a, a, our provider. And that's a decision engine that sits around that. And so the outcome that you get from that is the declaration of compliance to the policy. So the this person is X, and this is the policy. The declaration of the age attribute, the declaration of the competence level, uh, the confidence level, and then other outputs. You might get the method and the authentication and binding associated with that as well. So does that diagram help? And that's one of the questions for the week. And there are other diagrams out there which might be of assistance. And feel free to draw your own. There's some flip charts, some pens. Get creative, draw a picture of a giraffe, whatever you want to do. And if you're online, feel free to um, draw diagrams, uh, send us a PowerPoint, send us a slide, uh, send us something that we can uh, uh, feed into that process. Uh, diagrams are really tricky to do on a global basis because they've got to be, mean the same thing globally to uh, all different uh, providers. But yeah, that's part of what the week's um, fun, and, fun and games. Um, that gives you your outputs. Uh, the standard is uh, started off as what's called a PWI, a preliminary work item. That's now finished. So we've done all that bit. Um, and it was uh, broken down into three parts. So part one is a framework. Um, and the idea behind the framework is just really to describe what age assurance is, uh, what the conf confidence issues are, uh, the, the uh, levels of confidence, and a bit about privacy and security objectives. So it's quite high level. It's not intended to say it's either uh, you know face or voice or uh, a banking connect or whatever it, the, the modality is, that's not part of what the part one is. It's a framework within which you say these are how we're going to standardize the approach to these things. Part two is then about benchmarks. Um, so it's, it's got a rather tricky title, uh, Benchmarks for Benchmarking Analysis. Uh, uh, the, part of the reason for that is how it translates globally. But um, this is uh, where you're saying, like, okay, what the point you were making there, you're talking about the different levels. This will be where that's specified and, and how you then do that, that, that benchmarking. And then part three, which is a preliminary work item still, will be on issues around interoperability, technical architecture, and guidelines for use. So there's a lot of detail that's come through this. A lot of the stuff that we've had as comments have been really, really good and really helpful, but a little bit too detailed to go into a framework document. So we've got a space that we can put those really useful things in in what might be a more detailed uh, document. And that's a piece of work that we're hoping to kick off here in Manchester um, uh, as, as, as the next stage. I'm going to run through an outline very quickly because I've run, on, run into my time limit, I think. Um, but I might eat slightly into Ian's time limit. Uh, apologies, Ian. Um, uh, so the framework uh, is about. Um, any type of relationship between a decision maker and a citizen. So, it, 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 we are not interested why you're asking or why you need to know how old they are. That's not part of this standard. Any product, any content, any service, it's not about pornography or about gambling or about anything individual. There's a host of reasons why you might need to know the age of somebody. You know, uh, senior citizen bus passes is another. There's loads of reasons. There's a session coming up this week on age assurance for self driving cars. All kinds of reasons why you might need to know these things anywhere in the world. So it's not about uh, trying to comply with European law or US law or whatever. It's not interested in what the law says. It's not interested in what the policy reason is or the, or the regulatory reason is why you're asking for age assurance. Uh, so that it's, it's agnostic to, uh, to all of that. But it's not interested in what the particular solution is. So it's, a, it's an outcome or a, 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 a performance-based standard, not a process-based standard. So we're not trying to specify how you do the face age estimation or how you do the uh, different types of, um, of modality, it, but it's how they perform and what the uh, outcome of them is. So you can, that, that way you can compare 
once you've got it standardized, you can compare uh, face age estimation with voice age estimation, and you can look at whether or not they, how they perform relative to each other. Uh, it's proposing the approaches to indicators of confidence, um, the applicable privacy and security concerns that are around, and the guidance for policymakers on how they might uh, utilize the standard, but it doesn't prescribe anything for those policymakers. And as I say, our aim this week is to get that to a CD uh, stage, uh, committee draft stage. The benchmarks, so this is about how you measure it. So you've got a product and it's doing something, how do you measure that? What are the metrics you use? What are the test assets you use? What are the test protocols you use? What do we do as the age check certification scheme when someone sends us a product and says, test this for us? Um, uh, very, really interesting that um, one of, the, one of the key challenges that we face, and Alistair from UCAS will know this really well, is we are doing a certification scheme which is not based on how you manage your system or your service, uh, or how you manage it in terms of being a, a management system such as AI management or, um, or, or, uh, or information security management. It's based on the performance of the product, service, or, or, or system um, itself. And that's a different strand of international standardization for um, testing and analysis and certification than management systems uh, certification. That's been a really interesting aspect of, uh, of, of this piece, particular piece of, uh, of work. And I'm, I know Alice is going to give you, giving a presentation later uh, where hopefully he's going to explain all that to the rest of us. Um, we've been liaising with something called CASCO, which is the Conformity Assessment Committee for I, uh, ISO. Uh, we've been uh, looking around benchmarking standards and there's existing methodologies of how you do benchmarking and reporting on on benchmarking. We are aiming to link that to accreditation of conformity assessment so that you can have confidence in people like us. Um, so when we do a test certificate, we do we issue a certificate. How do you know that we've actually just not printed it on a piece of paper? We are regulated. We are regulated here in the UK by UCAS. They come in and, um, and, and regularly check and assess that we are doing the job properly, the certificates are correct and uh, all that is done correct. And then they are checked themselves by uh, the um, appointment they have with the UK government, but they also do peer review across the world so that you've got a consistency of approach both within the individual um, certification bodies, but globally across all of the accreditation process. And again, uh, UCAS are going to give a presentation later on to explain how that all works. Um, and uh, we've got to have this industry, industry demand because this is what industry wants to see. They want to be able to get out there, sell their product. They want to be able to describe their product in a way that the customers will understand in the way that is cons consistent. When customers are comparing the marketplace, it's very hard to do that if you're trying to compare different uh, services. So standardization will help with that process. And the uh, regulatory ecosystems need to work too. I um, appreciate it. I'm coming up to time. Part three, very new. Uh, we're still working on the content, so it's a proposed new work item. Um, uh, we will uh, be exploring the issues around the interoperability. We'll be looking at the descriptions and the technical detail of architecture that might be useful to go in there. We don't want to get too detailed on it, so we'll look at what goes in. Uh, opportunities about some guidelines around the privacy and security uh, objectives, and there may be some informative annexes in there. Uh, if it, any of you are familiar with standards, you might come across the term normative and informative. So normative is a requirement of the standards. So if, if you want to get certified, you have to meet all the normative requirements. Informative are, as I say, they've got guidance, they're information, they're things that might help you understand what the standard is trying to achieve um, in there. So they will see different uh, approaches to that. And then the timetable, uh, finally. Uh, we're here in the middle um, in, in Manchester. Um, we'll get the committee draft out at the end of this. Uh, there'll be a ballot, so that goes out globally for a ballot that will take place during the summer. Um, that will then come back and we should end up with a draft international standard. There's then a process of, of translation and it goes through an editing process to make sure that it's consistent across the uh, standards um, uh, development. And then there'll be a final uh, draft international standard ballot uh, probably early next year with a view to publication probably in April or May of next year. So we are, uh, standards development takes about three to four years generally. We're a good um, uh, two or three years into the process at the moment. Timetables, these aren't promises. It's a global process. We have to, in order to have a standard, you have to uh, demonstrate you've got global consensus. This is a big part of that. This week is a big part of gaining that global consensus and gaining that global uh, input. 
Uh, it may slip. Uh, we're still working on that being uh, our aim for April 2025, but uh, uh, your input, your uh, responses are very, very welcome. That's it. Thank you very much for listening to that. Uh, I don't know what's up next.